All right. Hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series and podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Michael Rubin, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, AEI, join us to discuss, is the Islamic Republic of Iran stable? Dr. Rubin will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I'll turn the discussion over to Dr. Michael Rubin. Thank you very much for having me. And I want to thank the Middle East Forum. Uh, it's one of the places where I got my start as an intern and later on editing the Middle East Quarterly. Um, and I truly appreciate everything that Daniel Pipes has done uh, to foster debate and to advance debate. I think history has shown uh, Daniel to be right far more often than most analysts and far more often than he's wrong. Uh, so again, just the preamble, I want to thank the Middle East Forum. I want to address the issue today about the stability of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Sitting here in Washington, there's a phenomena that we've seen throughout history where people will look at our adversaries and assume that they are far more stable than they are. We saw this up until the downfall of the Soviet Union, for example. However, when we look at the Middle East, when we look at the Middle East today, and when we look at the Islamic Republic of Iran, there should be warning signs which are flashing about the future stability of the regime. And the reason why this is important for policy is the last thing we should want to do is throw a lifeline to a failing regime and to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. That's not to be Pollyanna-ish and to suggest that the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, and its fall would result in something democratic, liberal, progressive, and peaceful, but rather, that we should be aware that the regime that we're seeing now is entering its zombie phase uh, of dead man walking. The reason why I say this, and again, as some of you know, my, my doctorate's in Iranian history. I used to, I did my doctoral research uh, in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, as some of you know, the issue with regard to Iran is that um, there's been, Iran is very different from other Middle Eastern states throughout history. Uh, it has a near contiguous history going back more than 2000 years, um, even though uh, in recent years, in recent centuries at least, it's only it's lost about half of its territory. What I would argue is that the Islamic Revolution in 1979, contrary to often what was written about it in the years following, wasn't the natural pinnacle of Iranian political evolution but was rather an anomaly. Simply put, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, who led the Islamic Revolution, got lucky. What we know now, and we didn't know then, for example, was that the Shah had been diagnosed with terminal cancer back in 1974. And so four and five years later, when he truly needed that energy, he simply didn't have it. Um, and then there's a lot of just chance in terms of protests that got out of control had France not returned Ayatollah Khomeini to Tehran, we could have been looking at a very different situation. One of the things which is most interesting, and I wrote about this in my book, Dancing with the Devil, which was a history of American diplomacy with rogue regimes and terrorist groups, is that the Islamic revolution was about to spin itself out, or many people believed it to be. One day before Iranian radicals seized the American embassy in Tehran, Stephen Erlinger, who would eventually become the New York Times dipl chief diplomatic correspondent, but at the time was a young roving reporter, wrote a piece, I think it was in the New Republic, arguing that the religious phase of Iran's revolution is over. Uh, the whole reason why which we had an embassy there in order to engage um, was because we thought that Khomeini could just be a blip on the radar and we could somehow get back to normal, even if not with the shock. Well, what happened, of course, was when Saddam Hussein invaded. That was the second crisis on top of the embassy seizure. And that enabled Khomeini to rally uh, people around the flag of nationalism. Well, let's fast forward. While the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps was able to consolidate control in the 10 years that followed, largely because of the emergency of the Islamic Revolution, we had a situation in which, uh, starting in 1999, there were massive protests around the country, and I happened to be in Iran when these broke out. 
You had student protests that erupted in 1999. You had a riot that spread out of control back in 2001 when Iran lost three to one uh, to Bahrain in a World Cup qualifier. And the rumor was spread by Los Angeles diaspora television that the regime had ordered the team to throw the match so that men and women wouldn't dance together in the streets. Whether or not that's true, put aside the fact most Iranians believed it to be true, perception means more than reality. Then of course, in 2009, we had the post-election unrest. Starting around December, 2017, we've had near constant, near constant um, economic uh, unrest. And what's interesting here is we've actually had in some spurts of this, security force members join in and be shown physically burning their security force ID cards and so forth. Uh, the Bor Ladan Boraman from the Abdurrahman Boraman Foundation, who chronicles this in a very dispassionate way, has estimated that over the last year, there's been at least 2000 different uh, spontaneous demonstrations and protests in Iran. So what the point of this is that there's growing momentum of unease and more than 40 years on after the Islamic revolution, this, this notion that you can simply blame all the troubles of the regime on outsiders doesn't really hold sway with Iranians. Now, what there are a couple uh, issues which are creating a perfect storm. It's all well and good to have nationwide protests, um, but the regime can put these down. And the whole reason why the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps exists isn't simply to conduct terrorism against the West. In its founding statutes, it talks about how its goal is to be export, is export of revolution. And at the same time, it talks about how its goal is to, um, and, and this is what differentiates itself from the regular army, its goal isn't territorial defense, it's defense of the revolution, which means its enemies can be internal or external. This is one of the reasons why the reform movement would never actually work and could never work, simply because it's all well and good to talk about a dialogue of civilizations, but the, in, the whole reason why the Revolutionary Guard exists is to be sort of like a Praetorian Guard to, um, to protect the person of the Supreme Leader. Now let's talk about the Supreme Leader for a second. The Islamic Republic had Ayatollah Rukhullah Khomeini, who led the revolution, came back to Iran thanks to Air France on February 1st, 1979, and he died, I think it was on June 3rd, uh, 1989. And his funeral was the next day. If you go and look at YouTubes of that funeral, um, there were crowds in the street, there was a heat wave, they were spraying people with water cannons, not as crowd control, but because of the heat and the quip on the street of Iran at the time was the old man was so senile, he forgot to close the door on the way down. If that's the way they talk about Ayatollah Khomeini when he died, I, this was a man who actually had true religious credentials and he also had a great deal of charisma. Now, shortly before Ayatollah Khomeini died, there is a switch in his deputy. And a lot of people forget this, but his former deputy was a gentleman named Grand Ayatollah Hussein Ali Montezeri. And for a lot of reasons, Grand Ayatollah Montezeri was cast aside last minute and Ayatollah Khomeini chose uh, the president, Ali Khamenei, the current Supreme Leader, to be his deputy. So in a way, it's almost like what King Hussein did in Jordan by pushing aside Prince Hassan at last minute to put in someone else, in this case, current King Abdullah in Jordan. The problem with Ali Khamenei was the reason he was cast as this uh, new Supreme Leader candidate was because he was a rather colorless figure. He didn't have the full religious credentials, but he was a compromised candidate. By 1989, you already had inside the Islamic, Republic, uh, Islamic uh, Revolution in Iran, you already had um, basically all these factional divisions uh, being created, Ross and Johnny on one side and others on the other. And so they needed someone that everyone could agree on. And so they chose Khamenei. Now Khamenei never had the religious credentials that Khomeini did. So even after Khomeini died, he could point and say, Khamenei is my man and his word would mean something. Khamenei never had those religious credentials. A lot of people forget, but in 1994, um, the leading Shiite Ayatollah in Iraq, a guy named Araki, 
A-R-A-K-I, passed away at age, I think, 104. And Ayatollah Khamenei decided he was going to put his name forward and say, I am the supreme leader of all Shiites. And he was basically laughed off the stage. After about a week, he had to formally renounce his claim. And this is just, just an indication of how little religious legitimacy he has. So what does this mean today? He's not going to be able to appoint someone the way Khomeini appointed someone. Why are we talking about this now? Khomeini is, I think, 82 years old. He's partially paralyzed from a 1981 assassination attempt. And he's also had cancer. And we know this because he's tweeted out pictures of himself getting treated for cancer. So regardless, even if that, he survived that bout of cancer, 82-year-olds, their longevity is limited. So people are actively starting to talk about this. There was discussion that Ibrahim Raisi, the new president of Iran, was being promoted in order to take this position um, and, and to move into this. However, when I talk to people in the Middle East, they say a few things. Now, it's important, and this is one of the reasons why a lot of universities fail, uh, and also some government officials when it comes to Iran watching, because what's on paper and what's on reality are two different things. So on paper, you have an assembly, a clerical body called the Assembly of Experts, which chooses the new Supreme Leader. We know from 1989, when Khomeini died, that basically they're just a rubber stamp body. It doesn't matter what their role is on paper. They don't make the decision. The decision is done in all these back, backroom deals behind the scenes. Well, here's where it becomes important. When Sultan Qaboos died in Oman uh, a couple years ago, the Omanis, by their constitution, had to choose a new leader within two, two days. When the supreme leader dies, there's a procedure to choose the new supreme leader. But as the intelligence services of various Gulf Arab states will point out, there's no timeline associated with that. So what happens if you start the succession process, but you never actually get a vote? Would this allow the Revolutionary Guard to come in and sort of put on its own candidate uh, on the throne? Uh, the other issue that's out there is we don't know whether the Supreme Leader is going to be a single person. If they can't come to a consensus, there's actually nothing, and this revised uh, a discussion from the 1980s, there's nothing that says you can't have a council. But if you have a council of Supreme Leaders, then you're going to have a situation in which you're going to have factionalization at the very top. When I talk to Iraqi officials, they say they think Ibrahim Raisi would be the next Supreme Leader. But if he's not, if Mujtaba Khamenei, the son of the current Supreme Leader is, that could happen, but only if he's part of a council again. Now let's talk about the Revolutionary Guard. You know, 40 some odd years after the Islamic Revolution, we always talk about what we know about Iran, but we don't talk about what, after billions of dollars spent, we don't know about Iran. We talk about hardliners and reformers when it comes to the political sphere. Khatami is a so-called reformer. Raisi is a so-called hardliner. But what's the factional division within the Revolutionary Guard? And the answer to that question is we don't have good insight, but we know that it's not a, homo a, homo a homogenous group. Now, one of the issues that should come into play right now is again, talking about some of the economic um, protests. Security force members, members of the Revolutionary Guard are actually starting to tear up some of their, their membership cards and so forth. The other thing we don't know is within every province of Iran, you have a Revolutionary Guard unit which, whose job it is, is to keep order in that province. We don't know whether the Revolutionary Guardsmen in each of those provinces are native to the provinces in which they serve. If they are, that shows that ideology runs supreme if given the order to fire in crowds in the street. If they're not, that shows that even the Supreme Leader doesn't trust them. Now, as I conclude, I just want to point out the environmental protests of this year. The reason, I mean, Isfahan, the river, the Ziandarud in the middle of Isfahan ran dry. It didn't run dry because of global warming. It ran dry because Revolutionary Guard owned companies were getting tenders to build dams unnecessarily simply because the government wanted to push money towards them. Now, the reason why this is important is it increased the tone of the rioting, not just into an anti regime riot, but into an anti revolutionary guard riot. And that's why the Revolutionary Guard and the regime is so afraid of environmentalism, because it's the one movement that can unite people across the ethnic and political spectrum. 
So why don't, I mean, we can talk a little bit more about what could happen, about the potential for civil war, but what I'd like to do now is turn to questions so that we have a lot of time for back and forth and I can work in some of that other material um, into our conversation. So again, thank you. And um, um, if we can go back to moderation. Absolutely, thank you so much. So the first question we have in is from Daniel Pipe saying, Michael, thank you for your kind words. Uh, can dissidents succeed in Iran without a leader? Um, that's a great question. Can dissidents succeed in Iran without a leader? What I would say is that when we look at the diaspora uh, in the United States and elsewhere, there is no hope that that diaspora will play a meaningful role in Iran. And the reason is because, uh, I mean, you've had generational shifts since most of those came to Los Angeles. The exception to that could be uh, the son of the Shah who lives near where I'm speaking to you in Potomac, Maryland, not in terms of the son of the Shah resuming power. Um, and when you know the personality of um, Reza Pahlavi, uh, the exiled son of the Shah, he recognizes that his father was a dictator and he recognizes that to take two hands on of a position would actually backfire given the family's legacy. But when it comes to be a uniting figure, he could play a role over a constitutional convention. One thing that's quite interesting is about 10 years ago, I went to a wedding down in Miami, uh, a friend of mine from school. And my friend didn't had his wife was having many of her family members come in from Iran. And what my friend didn't tell any of them was that the best man at the wedding was going to be his imperial majesty, the, um, the, the son of the former Shah. For security reasons, they didn't tell them in advance. So you have all these Iranians coming from like a labor family, the people that traditionally were opposed to the Shah up to the Islamic revolution. And when they saw the son of the Shah sitting there, they recognized him immediately, and it was amazing. They got down on their knees. They apologized. I mean, it was that sort of reaction, which was genuine. Uh, that said, this is one of the reasons in Daniel's question, and he has the experience, is head on. It's one of the reasons why I'm not optimistic there's going to be a smooth transition in Iran, because um, you're, in Iran, you're going to have 100 generals for every private, and it's going to lead to chaos. All right, thank you so much. From Carrie Hillebrand, should the regime collapse or be ousted, what do you see rising in its place? Okay, if I were a betting man and I had to put odds on, I worry about a military dictatorship. Um, I'm not sure whether any clerical body is going to be able to consolidate control. And the work of Ali Alfona, my former colleague, uh, who has published frequently in the Middle East Quarterly, has also um, look at the role of the Revolutionary Guard. And he's posited that what they've staged is a slow creeping military coup d'etat. He posited that in the Middle East Quarterly before it became conventional wisdom among people like Hillary Clinton and within the State Department. So the key question I have is if you're going to have any positive outcome, and given that the Revolutionary Guard now controls 40% of Iranian trade, uh, manuf um, GDP, I'm sorry, manufacturing, oil, construction. How are you going to prevent the Revolutionary Guard from doing that? Then the question becomes, will they be a simple military dictatorship like we have with President Sisi in Egypt? Or are they going to retain their ideological component, which is so xenophobic and anti-Western? And that's what we don't know. And again, um, too often we might look at and project our own sense that um, this rhetoric that comes from Iran is just crazy talk. But it's possible to go into the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps bubble when you're eight or nine years old. They run, basically you can think of them like evil Boy Scouts programs. <clears throat> and the fact of the matter is, if you are indoctrinated from that age, could you truly believe that rhetoric? And so that's, again, another unknown 40 plus years after the Islamic revolution. Thank you. Uh, Pumi actually follows up on that. The people of Iran are known to be educated and uh, fairly liberal. Uh, how, ca how, can the, how came that a fundamentalist Islamic, Islamic, Islamic regime, regime, regime power so long? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Pumi asked a great question, first of all, uh, this is one of the reasons why um, 
and, and I think Martin Kramer has written on this, as has Daniel Pipes, um, social scientists have never successfully predicted a revolution. Um, but number one, the guys with the guns matter. Um, it's all well and good to rise up, but you don't want to be one of the people that's killed in the uprising. Um, when it, It's important to note that when um, the Islamic Revolution happened, the full 10% of Iranians participated. Compare that with 1% of Americans in our revolution, 2% of Russians in the Bolshevik Revolution. And this is in the era before social media. The thing was, they were all united in what they were against, the Shah. But Khomeini was very successful in throwing sand in their eyes about what he actually stood for. And he, meanwhile, he told all these Western diplomats and news media, I have, and I'm quoting, I have no interest in personal power. What I want is democracy. And of course, this was nonsense. Um, this is one of the reasons why Daniel has been at the forefront of being right about being cynical about the rhetoric of groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and so forth. Uh, you can't trust what they say. It's important to realize where their ideology leads them. Um, at any rate, what allowed them to keep power was the crisis of the Islamic Revolution. In all likelihood, I would say, and this is of course a what if, that if it weren't for Iraq's invasion of Iran, the revolution would have imploded long ago. They needed that crisis. And this is one of the reasons why this anti-Americanism will never dissipate under the current regime because they need to try to rally uh, Iranians around the flag and distract them to the reality of their own management. That said, when we look at brain drains, and we saw this in Iraq with Muqtada al-Sadr and crew uh, and other militias targeting the educated, the middle class, and so forth. We look at a brain drain as tragic. The Iranians look at it as in their interest, the, the pro-regime Iranians look at it as in their interest because these guys don't vote for us anyway. And so if you do have um, a collapse of the regime, I would actually, I would predict, uh, even though I don't want to, that a lot of the more liberal, progressive, pro-Western types are going to be forced to flee the country rather than set the stage for a new regime, simply because they are going to be less willing to fight back brutally than the people who want them out of the country. Understood. And from anonymous attendee, what would be the tipping point in the ongoing protests inside Iran that would lead to a regime change? Well, no one knows what the tipping point is, and this is one of the reasons why I, I suggest that the, um, that the Islamic Revolution was far less um, foreordained and much more of a historical accident. By the way, the reason, one of the reasons why Khomeini stood up the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is he didn't trust the regular army because the army waited until the last minute before they saw which way the wind was going before they backed his revolution. Now, what could set the tipping point? Certainly, let's look at what impacts everyone. One of the reasons why I discount the Brenda Schaefer School of Thought or Mike Duran School of Thought when it comes to uh, ethnicity being a motivating factor that could lead to the fracturing of Iran is because that's much more likely to cause Iranians to rally against the regime. Uh, I'm sorry, rally around the regime. But when it comes to organized labor, the biggest economic protests in Iran aren't because of sanctions. They're because of the Revolutionary Guard distorts the economy, stands above the law, and refuses to play, pay wages. If you have ma massive labor unrest in Khuzestan, which is that province of Iran where the oil is produced, that's even if oil is $200 a barrel, if you can't produce the oil, then you can't sell it. This is one of the reasons why I don't understand why progressives in the United States and Greens in Europe don't support the progressive movement inside Iran and why we support organized labor everywhere else in the world and trade unions, except in the Islamic Republic of Iran, where arguably it could matter most. And I, I admit I'm, a, I'm an um, alumni of the Bush administration and Bush missed his Lech Walesa moment back in 2005 when Iran got its first independent trade union, the Vahid bus drivers. And again, I refer you to Middle East Quarterly where you could read about it first. At any rate, um, you have that, you have environmentalism and you have the stupidity of the regime. We oftentimes try to um, believe that our 
our opponents are without fault or flaw, that they just can't screw up. But we see, for example, with some of the Keystone Cops um, sort of episodes that led up to this 2010 plot to kill the Saudi ambassador in Washington, to kidnapping the Iranian American journalists and send her to Venezuela, that the Iranians are capable of screwing up. We saw when it comes to General Soleimani's death, how stupid do you have to be to drive? I mean, I drive that road all the time. And when no civilian flights are coming in at that time of night, when you have a road that is separated by blast walls from the civilian population, when you're literally right next to an American military base, how stupid do you have to be? How arrogant do you have to be uh, to believe that you can do this endlessly and kill Americans at the same time without reprisals? Now, what could some of the stupidity that the Iranians engage in be? I mean, they could, on one hand, they, they could do something atrocious, which would lead to a backlash, sort of like what Bashar al-Assad did when he murdered um, a child in Indiana to try to um, smother that initial uprising. But you've got a situation where what Iran does to counter this, when they have, um, when Iran puts people in prison, this is how, how they operate. They put people, in, I mean, sorry, back in 1999, uh, they reacted to the student protests by trying to smash heads. And that only caused the protest to spread. So what they did was they went into partnership with the Chinese, facial recognition software and all that sort of thing. Now, instead of smashing heads, they just take photographs. And they round people up over the next three or four weeks at two in the morning when you're not gonna have a lot of protesters in the street. And they might torture them, they might sentence them to death. They might sentence them to life. But then after a few months, they might give them um, a weekend off from prison. Now, when they go home from prison, when they have this small weekend, they're, they're, they're not the same person they were when they went into prison. And what they're trying to do as they go to um, go and grandma makes a meal and all their friends come visit them is to show this is what happens when you cross the line. And at the end of that, they have to go back to prison. And so that's the mechanism which the Iranians use to create a reign of terror so that they don't have to repress everyone the way Bashar al-Assad tried to do, but they just go after key figures and use them as intimidation. They lock, they don't throw them in a prison and throw away the key. They trot them out every now and then just to remind people of what they're powerful about. And when you actually look at Amnesty International statistics and so forth, what you find is that the rate of public executions also increases tremendously when so-called reformists are in power. And the interpretation I would have of this is that what the Iranians are trying to say is this reformism is rhetorical only for export only, don't you get any ideas? That said, eventually that's gonna come crashing down. And also when it does, you have the most opportunity when you have a vacuum of leadership. And that's why I'm focusing on um, the impending mortality of the Supreme Leader. Thank you. So Ken Miller, um, I'll summarize this, but there have been multiple attempts by the US to support the opposition within Iran. Uh, why should any groups within Iran believe that they could count on the United States to achieve a change in the government? Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Well, I would say, first of all, they shouldn't count on the United States. Certainly over the last couple of administrations, we have shown ourselves to be a country um, which we should not rely on, um, for which others should not rely upon us to defend um, their, their lives and their, their missions and their goals, uh, because we have a quite cynical approach um, and we discount the importance of alliance um, we believe that we can utilize indigenous forces to a common aim, but then we're not, we don't hesitate to um, sort of um, cut, cut those relationships off when it suits our purposes, forgetting that um, reputation matters. I mean, I would argue that ancient history for Americans is 10 years ago, uh, whereas ancient history for Iranians is a thousand years ago, and they're not so easily gonna forget. Um, Slights. I mean, one of the ironies here, of course, 
we self-flagellate so much about the 1953 coup, but we get that wrong. First of all, our co-conspirators in the 1953 coup were actually the clerics, the conservative forces who were upset at the Tuda and Moam party and Mossadegh's um, dalliance with the communist forces. Um, and that's why they spoke at the time of the Reds versus the Blacks, the Reds being the, the socialists or the communists versus the Blacks, the clerics with the black uh, turbans. Uh, at the same time, we get it wrong because Mossadegh wasn't a democratic leader. He was ex acting extra constitutionally because the democratic, um, the constitutional leader of Iran was the Shah with the ability to hire and fire. This is why back in the 1950s, we spoke about this not as a coup, but as a counter coup. Uh, and unfortunately, as we grew into our, our current rash of self-flagellation in the 1980s, 1990s, and so forth, uh, we changed the diction to look at this as a U.S. sponsored coup against Iran rather than uh, a counter coup in support of the legitimate Iranian government. Sorry, what was the initial question because I got off on the tangent there. Oh, um, can they trust the United States? And um, the short answer is no, they shouldn't. That said, um, what I would argue is while the United States, I mean, one of the ironies is we're blamed in nine, for 1953 when we shouldn't be. Let's not forget we occupied the country, parts of the country, back during World War II. And it's kind of interesting that no one in Iran talks about that, uh, which just goes to show you that perception means so much more than reality. The fact of the matter is we, can ha we have in our interest a stable Iran. Um, we also have in our interest an Iran that's willing to live within its own borders and not export its ideology. Um, there's been a lot of bridges burned, but that doesn't mean that we can't get a new start. That said, ultimately, I think we, um, the Iranians need to do this on their own. They shouldn't be relying on outside support. Frankly, I would say too much outside support will be delegitimizing. All right, well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our webinar. Uh, before we go, could you tell our viewers where we can find some more of your work? Okay, well, I use Twitter not as a, um, not as a discussion forum, but just to um, distribute um, my own work. Um, let me, I'm trying to put in chat um, my, um, my Twitter feed, which is um, at mruben 1971. Um, also, um, you could just go to the American Enterprise Institute web, which is easy because it's just www.aei.org, my stuff's there. And also, if you want to start exploring the Middle East Forum archives, um, a lot of my material is also there from my days uh, when I was editing the Middle East Quarterly um, and, and other, um, and, and contributing writing more frequently, the, the days actually before I had young kids. Um, I want to thank you guys. And um, if you're in Philadelphia, uh, my hometown, just give you an extra shout out. All right. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, for thank our viewers, you. please join, of course. Uh, for our viewers, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for an update uh, with Ashley Perry. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you again.